قصة هي قصة تاريخية سياسية Good afternoon, you're watching the English newscast on Future Television. I'm Linda Tamim and these are today's top stories. Progressive Socialist Party Chief MP Wali Jumblad seeks to limit any possible tension that could emerge over the killing of Sheikh Wahid al Balus in Syria. Agriculture Minister Akram Shaib assures Nami residents that the state will not exceed the seven day period for reopening the Nami landfill. And Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov confirms that Russia's humanitarian flights to Syria carry military equipment. Progressive Socialist Party Chief MP Wali Jumblat has sought to limit any possible tension that could emerge over the killing of Sheikh Wahid al Balus, a prominent Druze cleric in Syria. Speaking at the memorial service of al Balus held at the Druze Community House in Verdun, Jumla said, this is not an opportunity to challenge anyone and we respect all viewpoints. The Druze official who supports the uprising against Syrian President Bashar al-Assad said we have organized our differences with Hezbollah on the Syrian revolution. We also understand Lebanese Democratic Party leader MP Talal Arslan's stance. We don't want tension to reach anyone or any side. Both Hezbollah and Arslan, another Druze official, back Syrian President Bashar al-Assad against rebels seeking to topple him. Anti-government Balus was killed last week when two car bombings rocked Sweda, a predominantly Druze region in Syria. His murder stirred angry protest by the cleric supporters who accused the government of killing him. Agriculture Minister Akram Shaib has sought to assure Nami residents that the state would not exceed the seven-day period for reopening the Nami landfill, determined by his plan to solve Lebanon's waste crisis. He underlined that the PSP has been at the forefront of political powers that demanded the permanent closure of the landfill and will not allow its reopening. Shayib said all the necessary measures were taken to ensure that the landfill will be used to produce energy for the surrounding areas after the seven-day period, urging municipalities to follow up on the plan and ensure its accurate implementation. Meanwhile, the head of the Environmental Committee at Parliament, Marwan Hamedi, has called for a meeting on Monday in presence of Shayib. The meeting is set to discuss the minister's plan and listen to remarks by waste management specialists who helped shape the plan. The cabinet last night has endorsed Shayib's proposal to resolve the garbage crisis by transferring management responsibilities to municipalities, a key demand of civil society groups that have staged street protests over the government's failure to cope with the crisis. The plan announced by Shayib following an extraordinary cabinet session also called for establishing sanitary landfills in the northern district of Akkar and the Masna area near the border with Syria, as well as the reopening of the Nami landfill for seven days and supporting robust waste recycling initiatives. Two people have died due to the sandstorm that is still engulfing Lebanon for the fourth day now, raising the overall death toll to seven. More than 2,000 citizens have been hospitalized for shortness of breath and asphyxiation, according to the latest report by the Ministry of Health. Sidon's Hamshadi Hospital reportedly received more than 25 shortness of breath cases in the past few hours. Civil defense teams also managed to extinguish fires that erupted in the Akkad town of Kobayat, Antura and Mruj in the Mitten. Some private schools reopened their doors as public institutions resumed work. The meteorology department said the Middle East will remain under the impact of the storm throughout the day and the weather will gradually change as of tomorrow afternoon. A Lebanon magistrate has recommended the death penalty for Tariq Yatim, who was arrested in July after stabbing to death George Arif in a Beirut road rage incident. Beirut investigative judge George Rizet charged Yatim with first degree murder after the July 15 knife assault that killed Rif two days later. The deadly stabbing in broad daylight witnessed by dozens of passive bystanders had shocked the public. The killing was sparked following a feud over a car collision. The Nusra Front has announced it has captured a major airbase in northwestern Syria after a two-year siege by the group. 
The group also announced it has killed at least 100 government forces and captured 60 others in addition to capturing large quantities of weapons. In a new flash on Wednesday, state television reported that the army garrison that had controlled the military airport in the province of Idlib had evacuated the post. The airport has been under siege for almost two years by rebels who have captured most of the province. Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov has confirmed that Russia's humanitarian flights to Syria carry military equipment as well as humanitarian aid after the U.S. and NATO warned Moscow over its involvement in the Syrian conflict. Russia's Commerson Daily newspaper said earlier today that Moscow's advanced BTR-82A armored personnel carriers were among arms supplied to Damascus. Moscow has previously insisted in public that its flights to Syria were only for humanitarian purposes. The Kremlin decided to comment, declined to comment on whether Russian troops were fighting in Syria after sources in Lebanon told the Reuters news agency that Russian forces had begun participating in military operations there. And coming up next, the UN is expected to allow Palestinians to raise their flag at its headquarters in New York. More details next. Welcome back. You're watching the English newscast. The UN is expected to allow Palestinians to raise their flag at its headquarters in New York in a symbolic move highlighting Palestinian aspirations for statehood. The General Assembly is set to vote on a draft resolution that diplomats say is almost certain to garner a majority in the 193-nation forum. The resolution would allow the flags of Palestine and the Holy See, both of which have non-member observer status, to be hoisted alongside those of the member states. If adopted, the UN would have 20 days to implement the move, which would be in time for a visit by Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas on September 30th. Thousands of refugees arriving in Hungary have been taken to closely guarded camps surrounded by chain link fencing, barbed wire and patrolled with police dogs. Hungarian police said 3,300 refugees were taken to camps on Wednesday for initial processing after crossing the Serbian-Hungarian border. The AP news agency reported that refugees will later be moved to asylum seeker centers in other parts of the country. The detention of refugees came as Budapest prepared to deploy its military to bolster its border and stop people from crossing. Today only another 3,000 migrants have crossed into Austria at the main border point with Hungary, but thousands remain in Hungary while a record 5,000 more have arrived at the Serbian border with Hungary. This is according to reports from several news agencies and local media. UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon has called on European states to respond responsibly and humanely to the arrival of refugees and migrants in Europe. The European Parliament overwhelmingly backed plans by EU Commission Chief Jean-Claude Juncker to ease the burden on the bloc's border states from a wave of refugees, mostly coming from Syria. The lawmakers also called for an international conference bringing together the EU with the United Nations, the United States and Arab states in a bid to end the most serious crisis of its kind since World War II. They voted in favor of a motion welcoming Juncker's proposals for the relocation of 160,000 asylum seekers from Greece, Hungary and Italy and for a permanent mechanism of binding quotas to deal with future emergencies. The non-binding resolution was approved by 432 votes to 142, with 57 abstentions. And moving on to Asia, military helicopters have plucked residents from the top floors of their homes in Japan after raging floodwaters poured in and inundated a, way, a wide swath of a city north of Tokyo. As heavy rain pummeled Japan for a second straight day, the Kunagawa River broke through a flood berm sending a tsunami-like wall of water into Joso, about 50 kilometers northeast of Japan's capital. The flooding has forced more than 100,000 people from their homes, and at least 17 people were injured. Two people were reported missing. This marks the end of our bulletins for today. Now for a recap of our top stories. Progressive Socialist Party Chief MP Wali Jumblad seeks to limit any possible tension that could emerge over the killing of Sheikh Wahid al-Balous in Syria. 
Agriculture Minister Akram Shayib assures Nami residents that the state will not exceed the seven-day period for reopening the Nami landfill. And Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov confirms that Russia's humanitarian flights to Syria carry military equipments. Those were your top stories for today. I'm Linda Tamim and I wish you all a very nice evening. القصة هي قصة المثيرة السياسية